Okay, good evening everyone. Lovely to be with you. Greetings from the church at Newtown. We're meeting at the moment as well. We read these words in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Well, the world would be doing a bit of rejoicing over the Christmas period, but it's not the same as the rejoicing of Christian brothers and sisters as we gather together to worship God. Our reading is a well-known one this time of year. Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and we'll be reading through to verse 56. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias, and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfilment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed, forever. And Mary remained with her about three months, and returned to her house. Well, may I be one of the first to wish you a happy Christmas. And I hope you have a blessed Christmas as we think on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I hope it's not one that you'd rather forget. Sometimes they come along, don't they? But in everything we do over this festive season, remember that verse we started with, rejoice. We're to rejoice in all we see from the Bible, all of the readings, all of those things that are good. Don't rejoice in those adverts. Don't rejoice in those lights that all up Chartridge Lane. Incredible. Yes, we can think on the light of the world when we see those lights, but the most important thing is to think on him. Well, Mary rejoiced, didn't she? We're going to look at her song as we consider over the next uh, few minutes under three headings. Why was Mary rejoicing? Because she was. Secondly, in whom was Mary rejoicing? And in what was Mary rejoicing? And we'll get that from these verses. There's so much. They're jam-packed. Why was Mary rejoicing? Well, you need to go back to those verses we read, 26 to 38. A very familiar passage. Let's come to it, though, with fresh eyes. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Put yourself in Mary's position. Young lady, unmarried, virgin, going about her normal business, a typical young Jewish girl, looking forward to marriage, yes, looking forward to marrying Joseph, when, wham, suddenly God comes into her life. He sends an angel, doesn't he? Gabriel, who comes with a message that is absolutely mind-blowing. It is shattering. It is an incredible message. The angel Gabriel's first words, if you look at the NIV, are greetings, which is a bit weak, really, isn't it? In the authorised version, it's hail. Do you see what it is if you've got an NKJV? He says, rejoice. That's where I've got it from. He says, rejoice. And actually, apparently in the Greek, it is translatable as rejoice thou, rejoice you, you to rejoice. Because what he's going on to say could cause perhaps not so much rejoicing. Rejoice with this sudden shock. No wonder Mary, we're told, was greatly troubled, you see, in verse 29. But she listens on. She doesn't close down. She hears what the angel has to say, and he gives her a promise as he explains what God is going to do. And what a promise. Mary is told that she has found favour with God. Isn't that something that we all want? To find favour with God? Absolutely. And that's the first thing she's told. She's found favour with God that she, and that she is to be specially blessed. She is to bear the Messiah. Now the Jewish people you know were looking forward to the one who would deliver them, the one who they called the Messiah. This was good news, the best news indeed, but what news? What incredible news. The long-awaited one, the promised one, was going to come and she was part of that plan that God had set out. She, as a devout Jewish girl, would have known the Old Testament scriptures. She'd have known the prophecies. She'd have known the prophet's writings of God's Messiah. She would be aware that he was coming to reign, to save his people. And she was going to be part of this. But she still had a problem in grasping it. And wouldn't we all look at verse 34? Well, hang on, she says to the angel. I'm a virgin. I've, I've never had intercourse with, with anyone. I know not a man. That's what it means. 
She couldn't understand how she could bear a child without human agency. But that wonderful, wonderful verse 37, with God, nothing will be impossible, explains to her that it's really going to happen. No wonder Mary is to rejoice. And in verse 38, we see her acceptance of what is going to happen. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. I am the Lord's servant. No excuses. She took the words at face value. She believed God. And isn't that a lesson for all of us? When God says something to us through his word, believe it, trust it. However strange, however unnatural in quotes it might seem, he is the God who can do anything and everything with God. Nothing is impossible. And when we look at our world and its brokenness, that's great to know that. That we are trusting in an almighty heavenly father who, for whom the impossible is possible, probable, definite. What a, what a great God we have. Well, Mary, of course, goes off to see Elizabeth. And what she has been told by the angel is confirmed by what Elizabeth says to her. And Elizabeth's baby, who's going to be John the Baptist, leaps in her womb. Elizabeth utters some amazing words saying that Mary is the mother of my Lord. What a wonderful conversation that must have been. What a great meeting they must have had. Sharing what God had done for them. Elizabeth, she was past the age of childbearing. She's going to have a son. Mary was a virgin. She's going to have a son. What a wonderful, wonderful time they must have had together. And in verse 45, we see that Mary is commended by the older lady for the fact that she has believed what God has told her. Mary trusted God utterly. I wonder again, are we like that? Yes, she was highly favoured. No, she's not the venerated figure that we see in the Roman Catholic Church. She's not a saint. She is, though, someone who was favoured by God. She's not someone to whom we should pray. She's not someone who performs miracles. She was an ordinary Jewish girl, but favoured by God. And all of us, if we are favoured by God, then we too can rejoice in the way that, that Mary did. And she burst forth in praise in the verses that we're going to look at in some detail in a moment. She comes and she sings, says, the Magnificat. Magnificat because it's named after that first line. If you go to the original language, it says Magnificat. It's my soul magnifies the Lord. Indeed, I think this particular set of verses is very much part of the Church of England liturgy. It's something that over the years got, has been said in parish churches uh, together for, for many, many years. We don't do it so much in our reform circles, but it is a great song, as we shall see in a moment. Mary knows her place. That's what we're going to find. Mary knows what God has done for her. She is humble before God. And so should we be as we come to think on what he has done for her, but also what he's done for us. So why was Mary rejoicing? We've had the reasons there. Secondly, in whom was Mary rejoicing? In her song. Well, it could be a one minute, one second sermon, this. She was rejoicing in Almighty God. Of course she was. But she unpicked, unpacked many of his attributes that it would do us good to dwell upon. She knew it was he that could do all these things and was doing so. She didn't look at herself and say, Oh, aren't I lucky? Oh, that's great for me, isn't it? No, no, no. She gave all the glory to God. 
And so should we. She was the one chosen by God and she gave him all the praise. I wonder, do we give God the praise that is his due? For the special things of life and the ordinary things of life, he gives us so much. I wonder if we're humble before him, giving him thanks. Hopefully you'll get Christmas presents soon from some family and friends and they'll be lovely. What do you do when you receive a present? Maybe it'll come through the post. What would you do if you receive that present? You'll say thank you in an email, in a letter, on the telephone, whatever. But you'll say thank you if somebody comes up to you with a present. You say thank you. It's just something you do. God's given us everything. Do we say thank you enough? i leave that with us. I wonder, do we thank God in all aspects of life, recognizing his hand at work? Even when we look at our weather, which is very strange at times, and all this, this rain that we've had. I was thinking as I was driving up, looks like we won't have a drought next year then and problems with water because he's given us so much. And the Lord does do what is best for his children and we should give him the thanks and the glory. Well, Mary does just that. Uh, she gives a number of names to the Lord and his attributes. And I just pick out four or five of these as we go through these verses. Look at verse 46. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord. The Lord. This is the one who's exalted on high. The great Jehovah. The I am, the God of Israel. This is the, the God who has done so much. High, lifted up, approachable in a particular way. And here's Mary, though, speaking of him as someone who's had dealings with her. She recognizes who he is. She recognizes his condescension towards her, that he's actually blessing her. We are subjects of a mighty God. We are his people. And yet he chooses to bless us. How wonderful that is. What a privilege. What a God. He magnif she rather magnifies the Lord. What do you do with a magnifying glass? You make things bigger. We too should show people how big our God is. There's a chorus that we don't sing so much nowadays. My God is so big, so strong, I think it is, strong and so mighty. There's nothing that he cannot do. Do you know that one? I'll teach you it sometime. Yeah. But it's one that certainly our kids learn. And it's true. He is big. He is my, more than we can ever get our minds around. Let's magnify the Lord. But in verse 47, what else does she uh, call him? God, my Saviour. She already knows the truth of the gospel, even at this stage. Christ was born to save. That's in one of the carols, isn't it? And that is abundantly true. She knew that he would provide a way back for the people from their dark paths of sin. He would be saving them. There would be this reconciliation with God and everlasting life. God, my Savior. Just think about these words. Mary is saying before her baby is born that he would be her Savior. That's you know, that's quite something, isn't it, to say that? What insight? Only given her by God the Holy Spirit, surely. No wonder she rejoiced. Indeed, of course, you remember that Joseph was in on what was going to happen as well. If you read Matthew's account of the birth narratives, you'll see that Matthew, Joseph 
was told that he was to name the child Jesus. The angel told him that. Why? Because it means the Lord saves. He will save his people from their sins. And surely, didn't the people then and the people now need saving? Oh, so many people who are scrabbling around in our world, in our locality. So many people without Christ, with no thought for him. Oh, don't we need a saviour? Haven't we got an urgent message to tell people? Be reconciled to God. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So much bad news. There's more bad news, I think, nowadays than there ever was. But we've got the best news of all. We have the good news, the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. We are by nature sinners. No amount of seasonal cheer can gloss over that fact. But God intervened in history by sending his son. And we can be right with him through trust in him. Jesus, he saves. We carry on looking at the names here in this song. In some versions of the Bible, verse 49 talks about the mighty one here. In this version, he who is mighty. Mary contrasts herself with God. She's humble. She's nothing. But he is mighty, just like that chorus. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. When you think of might, what do you think of? A rocket going up into the stratosphere? The power of a pile driver? The strength of an army? Our God is all this and more. The Bible tells us that he has all power and all might. Numerous references in the Psalms to this. Um, God is indeed the Lord Almighty. Nothing is too hard for him. He's the one who brought the universe into being. He's the one who sustains it. He is the mighty one. Mary acknowledged that. We should acknowledge that. We should be so, so grateful that one so great as him has dealings with people like us. People who are made in his image. No wonder Mary was rejoicing. When I used to work for a living, I used to work in a school. And the headmaster at that school had occasion during one summer, I think it was about 1998 or something, to be invited to a garden party at the palace. And he went along, and he wasn't looking forward to it. He's, uh, he, was a, he still is a very strong Welsh gentleman who wasn't into English monarchy, apparently. Anyway, he went along to this garden party... And he was introduced to the Queen Mother, who was pretty much at the end of her life at the time. And when he came back from that garden party, his whole attitude had changed. It was almost one of those, I'm not going to wash my hand, I shook the hand of the Queen Mother. Because she was so, so gracious, apparently. People said that, didn't they? And she was lovely, he, he reckoned. Gracious was the word he used. That's just a little picture, a very pale picture, of our God who is gracious to all of us. Our God is the King of kings. He's much more gracious to us than an earthly potentate. He is the mighty one. He has legions of angels at his disposal, and yet he chose to speak to this young woman in a village He's chosen to deal with me and you, the mighty one. No wonder she praises him. He who is mighty has done great things for me, she says. And one more title she gives. Again, in some versions, it's the holy one. Again, we've got it in verse 49. Holy is his name. 
This refers to the name of God. This refers to his person. It kind of reinforces what we've already said, doesn't it? He is holy. He is set apart. He is different from you and me. He is sinless. We are sinners. We are finite. He is infinite, and so on. Yet he had mercy on us. The Holy One sent his Son to be born, to live, and to die. Isn't that amazing? No wonder we've got Mary with this song. Surely we too should be rejoicing that the Mighty One, the Holy One, the One who is lifted up, the One who is the Great God, is our Saviour. Isn't that wonderful? Well, thirdly and finally, in what was Mary rejoicing? We looked at the titles, but let's look at what God has done and was doing. Well, first of all, we see God's divine condescension. What does that mean? Well, we've already started to explore this. He who knew no sin, the Lord Jesus, came down from heaven to earth. He came and lived in our sin-stricken, polluted world. He condescended to come and live amongst us for a while. He literally graced us with his presence, didn't he? God made man. What a gracious act. What a wonderful thing was about to happen, and Mary recognized it. She was humble in the face of this. We tend not to use the humble word humble much nowadays, do we? It's seen in a derogatory sense often, but biblically, to be humble was, was absolutely right. In the authorised version, it talks about her being of low estate, or nothing in the eyes of the world, let alone God's eyes. The origin of the word humble comes from the Latin word humilis, which means of the earth. Humilis comes from humus. You've heard the word humus, yeah? Uh, it's of the earth. Mary recognized that she was earthly, and she humbled herself before God, who came down from heaven to earth within her womb. What a wonderful truth this is. Someone from the dust being lifted up and blessed and privileged. God is mindful of us. We were formed from dust and we'll return to dust. But in between, he's there for his people, isn't he? What a wonder, what a privilege, what grace. But she also rejoiced in God's mercy. Look at verse 50. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Here he is manifesting his mercy. He could have judged the world. He could have dealt with it in the way he dealt with most of the people at the time of Noah. But he had promised not to. And he sent a son, his son, to earth as an act of mercy on us, sinful people. God is merciful. We don't deserve anything except for condemnation, judgment and punishment. But Jesus came and he's given us that opportunity, that way of coming to God to be reconciled to him. And he's coming again as judge of the earth, isn't he? This mercy is incredible. It's just something we should dwell upon. I urge you to dwell upon it in the days ahead. You think of what it cost him when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Just, just think about it. The agonies he went through, the separation from his father, all for us. Love, grace and mercy shout aloud from Calvary. But also, Mary was rejoicing in God's righteous acts. You see that in verses 51 and 52. She talks about what he's done in, in the past. She knew her Old Testament, and she was able to 
think through what God had done in the past. He was in control then, he's in control now. He's not an absentee landlord. He is on the throne and we need to remember that. He puts down the mighty from their thrones and exalts the lowly. There are those who are in positions of authority today who are despots, who are tyrants. God can put them down in his time. His purposes are being worked out. He exalts the lowly, the lowly. He exalts those of low degree, it says in the authorised version. People who have a right view of themselves, he says, come to me, I will exalt you. It's a bit like that picture of the feast, isn't it? The person down the bottom, come to the top. We should be humble before him, recognising what we are. And he's the one who will bless us. Let's get our priorities right and leave everything else to God. She rejoices, verse 53, in God's provision. Filled the hungry with good things, the rich he sent away empty. That's not the way of the world, is it? The world's round the other way. But she knew that it was far more important to be spiritually rich than to be materially rich. She was filled with good things. She was hungry for his word. I wonder if we are. Are we hungry for the meat of the word of God? Not the milk, the meat. This Christmas tide, let's ask the Lord to help us to see amongst these familiar narratives, these wonderful truths, and to understand them more and more. <coughs> and then one more thing. Mary rejoiced in God's fulfilment of his promises. Verses 54 and 55. It was all planned in eternity. This was the time. The Saviour was coming into the world she speaks here of the covenant that God had made with Abraham and to his seed forever. The one-sided covenant, because Abraham had nothing to bring to the agreement. God had promised there would be one who would be the Messiah, the one who would be the Saviour. And she saw, as we can see as we read through the Old Testament, that this was the fulfilment of, of his promises. God had promised that he would send a saviour, Jesus, and her son is that one. He would save his people from their sins. And she went through her life knowing that. And there she was at the cross, wasn't she? Knowing that too. She believed. She's a Yes, she, she's someone who is ordinary, but she, the way she reacted is one that gives us lessons. She's not perfect. Nobody's perfect except the Lord Jesus Christ. But she knew so much that can help us in our Christian walk in the days ahead. Well, I hope that's helped. Let's pray that in these days ahead that we remember how God has intervened in history and let's rejoice in these things and give him all the glory.